Okay, hello, hello. This is chapter five on gases. We got two more chapters to go and then we are completely finished. If you saw the test and I don't know, um, a comprehensive final exam, which will be kind of new to be doing if we're still doing that all at our, our home. Anyway, this chapter is on gases. So if you really want to know more about liquids and solids, then you have to take college chemistry too um, in college because that, that's where they're found. But at least we give you just a taste of phases by looking at gases. Now, one of the first things I want you to know is the gases that you are breathing on a daily basis. Now, it's, it's, it's a multitude. It's a solution of things. But the three most abundant I want you to know are nitrogen, about eight, almost 80%, oxygen, a little over than 21%, 20%, and argon's about 1%. The rest of these, they vary based on temperature, altitude, and just general yeah, region of space. So know that that's what you're breathing. So when we talk about gases, generally, there's, there's only a handful of things that are going to be found in the gaseous state. So in terms of elements, you can see the ones listed in blue are naturally found as gases. And then here's, here's a nice list of substances. Now, at normal temperatures of room temperature and pressure, again, that's what you're going to find is they're generally smaller molecules. Because as soon as you start getting up into um, 10 or more atoms, they're going to have different intermolecular forces that would want to pull them together and condense to a liquid. So larger molecules have higher boiling points. So again, most of these are going to be fairly small. I mean, and this is at normal temperature. So you could vaporize larger things to a gas, but it would take higher temperatures or really, really low pressures. So some of the things we're going to look at first is stuff you already know. So the physical characteristics of a gas. So we know that gases we know they're fluid. Again, we normally reserve that word fluidity, or we, we tend to use it for liquids, but fluidity is a property of liquid in that both of them down here, liquids and gases, don't have a set shape. They, they change their shape to their container. That's what it means to be fluid. They flow. Um, and so liquids and gases are both fluid. Now, what makes them distinct is that gases can also change their volume. They are compressible or they can expand where liquids, while they're fluid, that, that doesn't happen. Um, now, gases will always mix nice and even, evenly and completely. So they form homogeneous mixtures. Now, this is sometimes true for liquids, but we talked about like dissolves like. So similar po polar liquids will mix, but we know um, oil and water, polar, nonpolar, they do not. But that's not true for gases. In the gas state, they all mix completely regardless of polarity. So polarity is not even, we won't even talk about polarity in this chapter besides to say like, hey, it doesn't really matter. So that's nice. Um, the volumes and pressures are, the volume and pressure is very sensitive to temperature. Now, you could technically heat up a solid and a liquid and change its volume, but it's, it's, it's a pretty insignificant amount. But gases, they can drastically change in volume and pressure with temperature. They have significantly lower density. So solids and liquids are called the condensed phases, meaning, you know, the part, when things are dense with density, they're clustered together, but gases are very spread out. So while well, these are the condensed phases, gas is the, the non-condensed phase. Again, just for comparison, if you were to take liquid nitrogen, it, um, it has a density as a liquid of 0 0.807 grams per milliliter or 807 grams in a liter. Um, so this is liquid nitrogen, nitrogen below 77 Kelvin, so really cold. But if you were to allow it to vaporize, it would expand um, and take up 650 times as much space. So 
the the density go, um, is much 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 lower. Um, you know, well, normally when you talk density, you normally report in grams per milliliter, but for gases, it'll be in grams per liter, just of how um, how small. This is a fantastic link. You should you should click on and watch. Uh, um, if you do, you'll be treated to the pleasure of this goofy guy inhaling sulfur hexafluoride and it's it's just a, it's just a delight um we will we watched it your sophomore year and we i won't hit play on it again but you definitely should so some terms that we'll use um diffusion and effusion diffusion like here you're seeing this partition removed and the gas particles spread out uniformly that that's diffusion and you can measure it in terms of velocity, meters per second, so how fast are particles traveling? Effusion, on the other hand, is looking at how quickly do particles move through a hole and or a pore, and this is measured in terms of time. Now, the reason we measure, we will, we have both uh, both terms is while diffusion is more common, it's easier to measure or visualize effusion. Like if I were to try to track how long would it take for the air I breathe out to travel across the room, to diffuse across the room, you can't really see it to measure it. But if you have a gas tank or a balloon that you're slowly letting the gas seep out, it's a lot easier to see the pressure or volume drop, and then you can measure, measure the effusion time. And since they're governed by the same kinetics, the same physics, um, you can, by knowing one, you can figure out the other. Again, when we use the word fluid, it doesn't just pertain to liquids. Gases are also fluid. Every time you walk through a room, wave your arms, gas particles are fluidly moving around them, allowing you to um, do all those fun motions. But because gases are so spread out, the light, light doesn't interact with them very much, um, and they're invisible to us. Again, here's a picture of dry ice. You know what it looks like when... As, as it sublimates. So at that point, as soon as it sublimates, it's dense enough that you can see it kind, its kind of fluid properties. Now it's, it's helpful to measure gases in terms of pressure. Again, if you, if you have a gas tank, typically it'll have a manometer or something that measures the pressure to tell you how much gas is in there. And so this is, we'll, we'll come back to this several times, but I want you to know that pressure is a measurement of how much force divided by a certain area. So the force in this chapter will be gas particles that are that are moving around and colliding with the surface, but then depending on how much area, how much it's actually colliding with will determine pressure. So pressure is what you actually feel. Um, again, this garden hose, there's a force of water coming out that's determined by the velocity of it moving. But whether you push the nozzle or not changes the area. And so you can make the same hose kind of lightly have water, have water come out slowly or like a jet where the force isn't changing. But as you decrease the area, the pressure goes up. And here we have stepping on a bed of nails. And you probably know not to step on one nail. But if you increase the number of nails, you increase the area and that decreases the pressure. So your force doesn't change. The force here would be your body weight, uh, your mass times gravity, but what you feel is the pressure. So the more area you have, the lower the pressure. Um, I have the bow staff and the sword down here. Again, if you got struck with one of them, you could probably imagine that with one, you're going to have like a broken arm and the other, you're going to have like one arm removed. Now, when you get hit with them, the same force is being applied. But anytime we talk about something sharp, like a blade, uh, what, what's significant is that it's putting all of the force in a really, really, really tiny area, which greatly enhances the pressure and removes your arm or whatever appendage. Uh, historically, the way we measure we measure air pressure is through a barometer. Uh, today, we have digital ones that do it a little bit different, but the, the earliest forms 
uh, used water, but they eventually found it was way more efficient to use mercury. So here is a glass tube filled with mercury that is inverted in a pool of mercury, and it is open to the surrounding atmosphere. So imagine air particles colliding with this surface, collide, collision, 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 collision. And the stronger the collision, the greater the force or the lower the area, the greater the pressure, and it pushes this level of mercury up the tube. So what they found hundreds of years ago is in this setup, in a one centimeter diameter tube, that at sea level, it could push it up 76 centimeters. And this is going to give us this weird unit of pressure called millimeters of mercury. So 76 centimeters is 760 millimeters. And we're going to say at sea level that air pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And so there's, there's a lot of different types of units. Uh, the SI base unit is the Pascal, where it's derived from Newtons per meter squared. Uh, a Pascal is about one hundred, it's, it's like one in a hundred thousandth of an atmosphere. Oh, down here, a hundred and one thousand Pascals in an atmosphere. Now, again, the ones that we're going to use are more common with the barometer. The so one atmosphere, which is what you're feeling right now, is 760 millimeters of mercury, where that's also sometimes known as a tor. Now, in the U.S., probably the most common unit of pressure we're familiar with is PSI. That is pounds per square inch. Again, pounds is the unit of force. Inch squared is the area. 14.7 pounds per square inch. If you've ever filled up your car tires, it's probably somewhere around 40 PSI. So um, there, there's a couple different factors for atmospheric pressure. Again, the biggest one is elevation. So you can literally think of air pressure is, again, if you think of swimming, when you go underwater, if you've ever uh, dove down in the deep end, you felt water pressure where it's literally just sitting on top of you and that, that force over your body is just added pressure. But then air pressure, you can think of it as, as this column of air miles and miles and miles above that sits on top of you. So at sea level, you have one atmosphere. But if you go up four miles, it's cut in half. If you go up another six miles, you're down to a fifth. Um, and so the higher and higher up you go, there's less particles pushing down on you. And again, it's, it's just the force of gravity pulling them all down on top of you. And so as, as you go up in altitude, so does uh, pre atmospheric pressure goes down. And then temperature and weather definitely affect them as well, but we're not going to worry too much about them. Um, this is where I would normally like to talk about straws and suction cups and those types of things, because I, I do want you to know that suction is not a pulling force. Um, it's, it's not a sticking force. You know, if you put a suction cup um, on something and it, it's sticking there, it's not because it's pulling to the wall. It's because it lowers the pressure on the other side. And then atmospheric pressure is able to just hold it there. Uh, suction cups and straws, you can watch this video about straws because that sounds fun. Um, they both work under the same concept of lowering the air pressure on one side and then the higher air pressure will push it up. So suction is a pushing force, not pulling. Again, when, when you're thinking about this pressure, think on the molecular scale that there's just billions and billions of collisions that are happening over and over and over. And so as the number of collisions go up or the force of collisions goes up, that increases the pressure. But also as, as the area gets smaller, that would also increase the pressure. Here's a fun video about air. Um, now, th there's a little math in this chapter. But here's a super simple one. If you go up to the top of Pike's Peak, your barometer might read that it's 468 millimeters of mercury. Well, what is that in atmospheres? So you only need to know that one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. So going back a couple chapters, we just need to know how to do dimensional analysis. We divide 
by that same unit and we have 0.62 so only about 62 percent of your normal air um, air pressure you would have at sea level. Um, now we talked about physical characteristics of gases and you knew, pretty much already knew those but now what I want you to what I want, we want to do is connect them to the kinetic molecular theory so again we can visually see the properties of gases but theories help us explain why they act the way that they do so these are molecular theories and kinetic molecular so the movement of molecules that help us understand why they act the way that they do and so for each one of these i want you to be able to cite an example know the implication uh, so the first one gas is made up of molecules that are separated but from each other by very large distances compared to their own dimensions and so what we mean by that is if here's a sample of gas um, that when you zoom in the each particle is considerably farther from other particles in comparison to their own volume so we can treat each gas particle like it has insignificant volume and so it doesn't matter if it's tiny helium or larger argon or larger xenon so because these particles are going to be so spread out anyway none of that matters what their actual radius is um, so this accounts for their very low densities because there's so much of a gas that is just empty space. This is also why gases are so compressible. Since there is room for them to get closer together, they are able to be compressed. Again, solids and liquids are already too close for that to happen. Um, and just for some numbers, if you were to take normal room temperature air at normal pressures, only if, the, if you could condense all of the gas um down it would only make up 0.2 percent in terms of the actual volume of oxygen and nitrogen and then the other 99.8 percent that that's just empty space uh, number two particles in a gas are constantly in motion and they're traveling in random directions so again this is again part of that whole fluidity concept um, and these particles are said to frequently frequently collide and they collide elastically meaning they impart energy or absorb energy from the particles that they collide with, but none of the energy is in terms lost. Um, so again, you can, any one of these particles is always gonna be moving. Now, any given collision might make them speed up or slow down, but the energy involved is conserved. And so later when we talk about the speed of a gas, um, there won't be one speed, it'll be a distribution. And so we'll always talk about the average speed of a gas particle, not, oh yeah, every particle is traveling exactly 300 million or 300 meters per second. Now, this is also why if you want to, if you measure the gas speed, like how, how fast the particle is moving, it will be different from the diffusion speed. Because if you pop a balloon, or spray some perfume and you're waiting for the gas to travel across the room it's not traveling in a straight line it's bouncing around forward backward and eventually it's, it's taking the scenic the detoured route and so diffusion rates will always be much much slower than the actual uh, velocity of a gas particle um, it's calculated that they travel about 500 times their own size between each collision. So every about every 70 nanometers, they're colliding and changing directions. So this is how we explain why gases diffuse and effuse. So they'll spontaneously, since they're always moving, if you change the container, they just keep on moving. So they change to the shape of the container because they're always just gonna be colliding. You know, there's, there's no set pattern or direction. It's just, it's just completely random. Uh, number three. So this this is going to touch back on a chapter we covered um, your sophomore year that is covered more in depthly in College Chem two. Um, but gases exert neither attractive nor repulsive forces. These are called normally called intermolecular forces. So again, if here's a gas and we say that all the particles are really spread out. 
the forces, because they're so spread out, they're too far apart to actually attract or repel each other. So we say the intermolecular forces are negligible. That is, they're not zero, but they're so small that they really don't matter. Again, if we look at liquids and solids, uh, if we talk about the hydrogen bonding in liquid water, they, they have to be within like, five angstroms which is angstrom is 10 to the negative 10 you don't have to know that but they have to be in close proximity to be able to have these types of interactions but in the gas state they're so spread out that it doesn't matter again intermolecular is between molecules so again this this, is, this one explains why gases mix homogeneously they're too far apart to care whether the next molecule is polar or nonpolar, so they'll they're just going to keep on moving randomly, and so their own identities don't dictate how they mix. The last part is that the average kinetic energy of a molecule is proportional to temperature. So from physics, you should remember that the kinetic energy of something is one half times its mass times velocity squared. Again, this line over here is just talking, just is noting that it's average velocity. Well, using this, we can point out that as temperature goes up, um, as, as far as kinetic energy goes up, mass isn't going to change, it's velocity that's going to change. And so with greater temperature, <clears throat> we get greater velocity. So faster gases have particles that move faster. So th this, this part helps indicate why that as temperature goes up, um, it's going to affect things like pressure and volume because with more pressure, higher temperature, as they move faster, that's going to lead to more collisions. Uh, another component of this is that if you have two gases at the same exact temperature, they will have the same average kinetic energy uh, regardless of their size. So keeping that in mind, let's, let's say we have um, two comparable gases, helium and chlorine, and let's say they have an arbitrary kinetic energy of five. So at the same temperature, they have the same kinetic energy. So the only thing different, again, we don't care about polarity. We don't care whether it's one or two atoms. The only things that matter are the temperature and the mass. And so if you put in their masses and calculate for velocity, you get these numbers. Now these numbers don't really mean anything because I just made up this number five just to make the math easy. But if we take a ratio, we get this. And so what it's telling us is that um, at this temperature, helium is moving four times as fast as chlorine. And so that's what we should expect. So as the mass goes down, velocity goes up. Again, if I asked you to throw a bowling ball and we clocked the speed compared to a baseball, you would expect, you know, throwing with the same force, you would expect with lower mass, you could throw the baseball a lot faster. When the bowling ball with greater mass, lower velocity. So those two things are inversely proportional. So we can use this to um, measure diffusion rates. Now, uh, gas diffusion, if we take those that equation, this equation and compare two different gases, we can come up with Graham's law of diffusion. So remember, laws, laws don't tell us why things work the way they, they work. Um, this was this relationship was discovered by a Scottish physicist named Thomas Graham, who in the 1800s worked out that their average, the ratio of their average velocities was equal to the inverse square root of their masses. So if you look at this equation, notice it doesn't say anything about the temperature because we would consider them the same. It doesn't mention anything about polarity. It doesn't have... Um, doesn't have anything to do with how many atoms there are. The only thing that matters to, for the rate of velocities is the is how big they are. Um, again, that's one of the fundamental points of gases is that we, we they have negligible volumes. Um, their volumes don't really matter. It's their mass that's going to determine a lot of their properties. And in this case, their diffusion rate. Um, so one, one way we can illustrate diffusion 
is if we open up a bottle of hydrochloric acid and ammonium hydroxide, where they're both very, very concentrated, what happens is because they're volatile, these, <coughs> um, these substances will evaporate away. There's ammonia and there's HCl. But when, they find, when the gas particles make contact, they'll produce a solid of ammonium chloride. And that ammonium chloride um, will be a suspension. And so this foggy haze that you're seeing is ammonium chloride, essentially dust. It would eventually settle. Now, what I want you to notice is that it's centered more on the HCl bottle and not as much on the NH3. And the reason why is, again, if you open these bottles at the same time, the NH3, which is about half as uh, massive, it can travel faster to get over here where HCl is bulkier and the slower. And so the meeting point is centered over here because this one moves slower and this one moves faster. Now, this is a not super common uh, thing you could really readily observe where you visibly see the meeting. So it's way more uh, convenient to measure a fusion rate where you can fill up a container, measure the pressure, and then allow it to evacuate into a vacuum and just measure the time it takes. And you can see how the pressure drops. Or if you were talking about like a balloon, you could see how, how long it would take for the balloon to shrink. Um, so measuring a fusion is we're going to see a law very similar. So here's the, in, the ratio of velocities. Here's the ratio of inverse square masses. And if you remember what velocity is, it's distance over time. So time for the first, time for the second. Well, if, in, if we have the exact same conditions, the distances are exactly the same. So that factors out and we get this. So this right here is the one that we'll be using. So the inverse time of a fusion is equal to the square root of the ratio of masses. And again, this is, we're doing, we have the second one because it's way easier to measure a fusion rate. So here's, here's a type of problem. Um, say we have a setup where we, as a standard, we allow bromine vapor to fuse out and it takes 4.7 minutes. We then take our unknown hydrocarbon in the same exact setup, fill it up to the same pressure, and it only takes one and a half minutes. So what is the molar mass of the unknown hydrocarbon? So using this equation, we have our two times, and we want to know the molar mass of this, this high unknown. Well, we know it for bromine, so we can just look up. Bromine weighs about 80. And so two of them weighs about 160. So bromine effused at 4.7 minutes. Here's its molar mass. Our unknown was 1.5. Here's what we're looking for. So we take the square of both sides, multiply by 160, and we get about 16. And the only hydrocarbon this could possibly be because carbon weighs 12 is methane. So CH4, which weighs about 16 grams. Now, another way to measure um, diffusion rates or how fast part gas particles travel is with this apparatus where you put your sample. It, it has to be volatile, so not it can't already be gaseous, something that can condense or, and solidify. So it's something volatile that you heat up. The gas particles vaporize and travel through this thing. And so these spinning blades, one allows a particle to travel through, and the other it will deposit on top of. <clears throat> and over time, you, what you'll develop is this pattern where it's deposited. And what you'll find is you don't just get one, um, you don't just get one velocity. You'll get some that are really fast, some that are really slow, and then then there's the average. Um, and so what you'll end up getting if you plot this graphically is something that looks like this. So up here we have three different plots at different temperatures, but you get what's called a Gaussian distribution, also called a bell curve or normal curve. So this is a very common statistical plot where you see kind of an average and then 
there's some that are going to be really far out on either side. Um, actually, the very top technically isn't even the average. It's the mode. It's the most common. The average usually lies just to the right of the mode. Uh, so this is showing something we've already talked about, that as temperature goes up, so does the speed. Um, now, for comparisons, I want you to notice that um, air, nitrogen, at about normal temperatures, it travels about 400 meters per second. Um, and so that's that's about the, the speed of air is 400 meters per second. Um, the fastest flight speed is about 2,000 meters per second. That's also known as Mach 6. So if you've ever heard of the term Mach, it refers to Mach, is, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. And you might have known that if you if you pass that, there's a sonic boom. You break the sound barrier. And the reason why these things are connected, um, <clears throat> that that Mach 1 is that about 400 meters per second. And so <clears throat> the, the sound barrier or the sound waves, they are traveling through the gas medium. And so what that means is if, if you're traveling faster than the gases that would carry those uh, sound vibrations through, that's when you're likely to get that sonic boom. Oh, and if we were in class, I acquired a whip last year, and um, it's it's kind of fun to crack a whip because it, it can break the sound barrier. Um, oh, a Rubens tube. You should click this and watch it. That's another fun thing to look at. You, it's a way to visualize uh, <coughs> visualize air and sound pressure waves uh, and sound waves using fire. Um, now, the other component, the, the speed of a gas is its mass. So again, we said if it goes up with temperature, it also goes up as the mass goes down. So from chlorine to nitrogen to helium, as mass goes down, speed goes up. And so mathematically, we can estimate this is the root mean square. It's a statistical essentially a statistical average, but the root mean square velocity by taking the square root of 3RT over the molar mass. Now, R is a constant, which we'll get to in another video. T is the temperature. So notice as temperature goes up, so does velocity. And then notice molar mass is in the denominator. As molar mass goes up, then we'll see the velocity goes <coughs> goes goes down because those are inversely related um here's here's a a proof of that equation but i don't really care to explain it so i'm not going to do that again i do want to point out that when you use this equation here is r it'll be provided um, it is in joules per kilogram mole and since joules have a unit of kilogram what that means is when you put in the molar mass you have to use kilograms so instead of saying that xenon weighs like 130 grams per mole, you would say it's 0.13 uh, kilograms per mole. And then temperature needs to be in Kelvin, so add 273. So let's try that for both helium and nitrogen. So with helium, it's got a molar mass of four grams per mole, but we're going to say uh, 0 0.00 four kilograms per mole. R is a fun number, you just get to plug in. And instead of 25 Celsius, you're gonna add 273 to get 298. Pretty much in this chapter, any time you see temperature, you need to make sure it's in Kelvin. So if we plug all that in, we get this. Um, we get 1.86 times 10 to the six, and it's the square root of joules per kilogram. Now, I, I like this part. Units are kind of neat because if you were to look at this, you would not be thinking that, hey, how is that a unit for velocity? But if you look at what a joule is, a kilogram meter squared per second squared and substitute, um, then kilograms cancel and you get the square root of meter squared per second squared, which is meters per second. So helium on average is traveling about 1,360 meters per second, uh, or about 3,000 miles per hour at normal like room temperature. Now, let's now compare this to nitrogen. So it goes exactly the same way. The only thing different is we're plugging in 22.8, 
times 10 to the negative 2 kilograms. And we get instead of 1300, we get 500 meters per second. Again, we're seeing that it travels significantly slower. And probably one of the biggest takeaways of that is it helps us understand our atmosphere. So our atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. That's a lot. Where if if you drop, if you let go of your helium balloon, you probably know that that helium is gone. That balloon is going to take off and eventually the balloon might come back, but the helium will have a fused out and it will leave our planet. So as the helium with its low density rises up and up and up, it will just start moving faster and faster as it takes on energy from the sun and it can get fast enough to break free from Earth's gravitational pull. It can reach what's called escape velocity. And once it reaches that, it's, it says goodbye to Earth forever and we don't see it again. Um, so just know every balloon you've ever let go, you've cost the Earth that helium forever. But on the other hand, nitrogen travels much slower. And so it, it doesn't it can't reach these speeds because of how heavy it is. Um, and that looks like a good place to stop. So in the next couple days, in two days from now, I will post a video on the gas laws. Um, and this is this will be the quantitative way we look at. Um, so we talked about theories today and how they explain the properties. Well, laws, again, they don't tell us why they work. They just allow us to quite robotically punch in numbers to make predictions about what how things are. But we'll get to that another day.